The Digital Head Voice podcast is brought to you by MedTech Word in collaboration with Digital Health Mota. Episode number 19, one more to 20 friends. And today we will be speaking with Dr. Ilya Radel Gruber another interesting medical doctor who made this jump from clinical medicine to business, healthcare, and technology. And I was really, you know, intrigued by by what he has achieved so far. And with that in mind, I'd like to intrigue you. So let's listen to the interview. So hi Ilya, finally we made this podcast happen, you know, and uh, I'm saying this because we, you know, in the past couple of months, we um, we really, really wanted to meet you, but for once, for some reason or another, because we're humans after all, we couldn't make it happen first time round or second time round, but the third time round, we made it. And third time lucky, in fact, the Modis have like, Klita total Bormla, Mush Bormla, Borma. And this expression is kind of saying like, on the third try, you, you manage, you know? So uh, I'm really, really happy to meet you here today, Ilya. And not only, not only because of what the work you're doing, but because you are one of the pioneers, so to say, to make this jump from the medical world to the intersection of business, technology, and healthcare. At the end of the day, when it comes to healthcare, healthcare is a bit like a business, you know, as well. So whatever kind of financing model supports healthcare, at the end of the day, it's all about outcomes, it's all about number of procedures, it's all about all these different outcomes. And I'm happy to have you here with us, Ilya. But with that in mind, I am sure you must have some really exciting story. Like, how are you here with us? How are you on a Digital Health podcast? You know, like what brought you here? You know, tell, tell us your story. Stefan, very nice to be here. It's a pleasure. Thank you for being here. And Austria will say all good things are free. So the third time must be a magical number. Yes. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, I get this question quite often because I made the transition from working in clinical practice to working in business and especially in digital health quite early. And my digital health journey started very early when I was in medical university. I Loved medicine always, but when I was in medical university and we went into clinical practice, I have seen that it's not quite m- what my passion is. I, I see my role more, more or less somewhere different. And it was very simple. I stumbled upon a documentary on YouTube. It showed uh, how the life looks like in 2058. And this was about digital health. And I've seen a person standing up in the morning going to the toilet and the urine is analyzed, is looking into the mirror. And then with this face recognition, you get the first uh, diagnosis in the morning. Then he falls down the stairs and then a helicopter is coming and measuring his uh, blood pressure. And I thought, okay, this is science fiction. It's 50 50 years in the future, but somehow there must be must disruption happening in healthcare. And I've then I've decided my role be outside the system working to drive this innovation, to make it happen. Working in clinical practice is very interesting and it's very fulfilling, but I saw my world difference. And so when I, I still didn't finish university at this time, I had to finish and then I was looking what I do next. And so I just spent a few months in clinical practice, but radiology fascinated me very much. And I also worked in research and radiology. And uh, actually, uh, back in the years, uh, when I was there in research, uh, I was working on my first AI project, uh, and I didn't know even then that was AI. I implemented in research um, a model for predicting the five years survival rate of ovarian cancer patients. And we talk, it's called texture analysis. So, and we have a publication, there's not no word about AI, but basically it was AI because we made pattern recognition. And, and the, then I thought, okay, um, uh, somehow AI, 
the I had really early touch points. But I went into consulting because this was for a young ambitious guy. It was like the the nearest way to 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 learn about business because I had zero experience in business. I only went was in healthcare and uh, worked a little bit in clinic and worked for big corporates in consulting. I where the learning curve is very very uh, steep. You learn very much and. Uh, this was the time where I've seen what is possible. We made a lot of innovation strategy projects, went to the clinics and uh, told them what is possible if you implement internet navigation with augmented reality, what is the future if you implement telemedicine, and what, is, what if patients uh, could be treated at home and stuff like that. It was really cool. I really enjoyed it. I worked very much. It was very long the working hours, but Doctors also work as much, so not much of the difference. And somehow later, I realized I decided I want, as a young guy, I know everything better. I found my own company. <laughs> this was the time when I left the corporate world. I have to admit that the first, uh, it was a try and error. I tried different things. Uh, one of the first projects was augmented reality in rehabilitation. We wanted to create um, how to make rehabilitation of patients at home possible so they don't have to visit the doctor. I even tried to do a um, healthcare marketing agency for doctors. So healthcare marketing full service agency only for, for doctors. And then I figured out, yes, uh, I learned a lot, but I have to learn more. And I pretty much believe in this was what uh, many CEOs in healthcare say that you have to be expert in something, uh, even if you climb up the career ladder. Especially uh, last week, I've seen a post um, on LinkedIn from Ben Wonsack, that's the CEO of Siemens Health News. And he said the, the, worst, the worst career advice he ever got was, if you climb up the career ladder, you don't have to be an expert in anything anymore. <laughs> oh, right. okay. Oh, this is <laughs> the first time I hear that, actually. I, I really, because... Uh, you know, CEOs have this kind of role of being a, a generalist, you know, someone who yeah. knows kind of a little bit about everything. And at the same time, they have to kind of more focus on being visionaries, you know, and kind of leading the company in the right direction. Totally. But, but, but yeah, I mean, like, this is a really good point that you, that you mentioned here. And, you know, you, you kind of struck me. Tell me the year again, Ilya. What year you were mentioning? 2050? Yes, it was. Uh, we made a documentary approach. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it was 2058. The documentary was from 2008, I think. It was 50 years in the future, yeah? 50 years. Uh, all right. Because, <laughs> you know, like uh, when, when you were mentioning this year, I was kind of thinking of this really popular game right now, Cyberpunk 2077. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you see the first part of the game, there's actually this whole person who is, you know, totally unconscious, you know, but he has special chips she has ch special chips you know to to measure all the bodily parameters and there was some like s there was even insurance integrated into the whole package like that this person is fully covered so they should come within four minutes to rescue her it was like mind-blowing you know and uh, and yeah I, I and also yesterday i had a really interesting discussion about this and how important it is, you know, uh, to kind of to allow science fiction as a genre to still prosper, and even we should still allow science fiction to prosper and to grow, even within healthcare. Why? Because without those kind of big visions and these big dreams, and especially when these big dreams are kind of made factualized, they are marketed, they're communicated, you can actually see it right in front of you. Uh, you know, sometimes it's much more difficult to to just count on someone's like talking vision, so to say. And you need to listen to these stories. So I uh, really, I, I mean, this is not about you know, this, like this session is really about you, really, and about your yeah, special yeah. story. But yeah. Panta Flow, where does it come from? You know, like um, I you you were mentioning. I'm not sure if the part about the healthcare marketing was Panta Flow as well, but. 
I'm really curious. First of all, why yeah. Panta Flow? That, that's my <laughs> question number one. But maybe you can tell me that or you can cool. say, oh, no, you know. Sure. And like, sure, uh, sure, sure. like and I, I would really love to hear, uh, Ilya, how did you work with healthcare organizations? Did you have this opportunity? How, how do you make it work for healthcare organizations and even health professionals that you work with? Tell me all about it. Very cool, interesting questions. I don't get this very often, this question, where does the name come from, but it has a background. Uh, as a person, when I was in school, I learned ancient Greek language and philosophy. And it comes from the philosopher Heraclit, who said, Pantare, everything flows, and Panther flow is like the English version of it. So I, I believe everything is in flow. If you, you, you can't put your foot into the same river twice, because the river flows. And in times of digital health, you don't even know in which river you will place your foot today <laughs> or next week. <laughs> yeah, like one river, one week, and uh, yeah, quite a... You know, Mota, we don't really have rivers. We only have sea. So I think that's even more interesting because you really don't know, you know, what kind of waters it'll be because it's the sea, you know. There, there is no, like, it's just, we're just surrounded by a sea. So, like, really, yeah. I have to admit, like, quite a good, interesting <laughs> um, uh, yes. ex- metaphor there, you know? Totally. So, that, that was the name uh, for the company. And what do I do? So, I, what I said, what I did, did in earlier times, which didn't go well. And I thought I did consulting really well. I loved it. And there's much potential. And so, Underflow is a consultancy for digitization in healthcare and especially for facilitating implementing AI in healthcare companies. And we have more or less three groups of clients. We have the old economy healthcare companies. We have the more or less SMEs and startup who are also AI first companies and who want to to structure themselves for for growth or don't have the, the the material and the tools of the big corporates and also bigger companies who want to make use of their data and who are very curious what is the potential of AI. And these are often companies and groups of people who don't want to make small POCs. They, they want to implement AI and see what is what is possible and to start with a bigger project. And that's what I also say is necessary today because I think Everybody, if you open the media or anything else, you see there's always the term AI. It was not three or four years ago. It was not like that. Even my, my research, when I, it was AI research, but it wasn't even called AI. So, so the, tension, the tension is really, really big. And this is a good thing. But the interesting thing is then that people get frustrated if it doesn't bring the results. And many people say, oh, yeah. Everybody's calling here. Yeah, I'm doing AI. Sometimes with companies who don't even work with machine learning engineers, and they call it AI. And uh, but people have to stay curious and to make use of AI because uh, the change will come. And just like the internet uh, 20 years ago was not that big or that relevant and useful for us people like it is today, um, you have to. Uh, stay on it and start experimenting and uh, implementing it. Even if it is just like, oh, just try a, a chatbot for patient uh, scheduling. What, what is the best appointment strategy? How many patients can I take per day? And uh, how can I work best with my outpatient clinic and stuff like that? So it's important to experiment. And what I pretty much believe is that just like the industrial revolution, this automated the blue color jobs, which people work manually, AI will revolutionize the white color jobs. People were wearing the white color uh, shirts. Uh, and this is uh, very important because pretty, pretty all of us are knowledge workers. The majority of us use our brain to work. and. And many, many tasks we do are very repetitive. So just like like uh, publishing a podcast, you have, you have to make ma- ma- many steps where you need your mouse and your keyboard. This can be automated. But we don't 
often think that in healthcare processes can also be automated. And I uh, pretty much think at, that Thomas Davenport is a person who have written a lot about automating knowledge work. And he says there are three types of knowledge workers. There's are people who create things, distribute things, and who apply things, knowledge. And yes, I, I give just an example. Creating, for example, if you're a medical researcher, you create knowledge because you find new things you created. Distributing is, for example, a project manager. He has the information in the center and has to distribute it to the right location that everything is in time, budget, and money. And then we have the, uh, uh, the majority is the knowledge workers who apply knowledge. And doctors, medical doctors, are also part of that. They, they apply knowledge. And this is something which is, uh, I see, I tell a story which really frustrated me when I was in clinic and later in consulting. I read a study which said that a medical specialty doctor, for example, a subspecialty in internal medicine like cardiology or nephrology needs about approximately 90 hours of reading time of the newest publications in his field on a reading time. Of course, you can say I don't have to read some publications to be, to be at my best, but uh, this is only your field. And you know, okay, maybe you can treat 80% of the patients very well, but the other 20 or 10 or 5%, whatever, I want to do my best. And if you don't have all the knowledge or the don't can apply it, uh, you won't be the best. And so I believe that the medical profession, medical uh, physicians, the role has to change. So they will be, have to become also more consultants. They won't be doctors who know everything and they have to repeat it. They have to know how to apply the knowledge. And this is a process. This is a general term. It implies a lot of stuff. It's uh, the, all the programs you know in audiology, which, which helps you diagnosing people. It's um, the patient administration process in the hospital, where I think everyone has experienced as a patient and as a doctor, you, you ask information twice or three times or four times the same thing, the patient. And this is what with projects that we do in Pantaflow are, we believe that it's important to automate this knowledge work, to, to foster, uh, to have more time for people all kind of people uh, so that the life of the patients gets better and i very often get the question uh, how is it that i am working with a medical background as a consultant in business why didn't i stay in the hospital and then i ask the uh, non-medical non, non people i ask have you been at your doctor and last time and how much time did you spend talking with your doctor and why <laughs> Usually they'll say that was not much time. <laughs> then I ask uh, business people, I ask them, have you ever worked on a healthcare project without, without a healthcare professional? And how well did the project go without the healthcare professionals? <laughs> then I ask, and if a medical doctor asks me, uh, why don't you work in a medical specialty? I ask you, how much time do you spend with uh, repetitive tasks and administration processes you think which, which are redundant? <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's I why. think we're gonna have to yeah. kind of uh, copyright these questions, you know, Ilya, because they're so <laughs> because they're so insightful. I might even borrow some of these questions myself because feel free, feel free. I <laughs> yeah, because I get I kind of get these questions, funnily enough, um, when I moved from hospital basically to public health because I'm a specialist in public health. I'm lucky enough to be so um, after some hard work and uh, and. And in, in my case, for example, right now, digital health doesn't exist as yet as a specialty in Malta. So, uh, you know, this is something that we have to create within this upcoming decade, you know, to kind of create a, a platform and framework of for future physicians to kind of, to specialize, you know. You could be a cardiologist and you specialize in digital health and then you create digital cardiology. Or you could be a nephrologist, you know, and you're focused on digital health, but you bring and you digitally transform 
your nephrology department. You know, I mean, the possibilities are endless, even for surgery. So, you know, we, we come to a stage, you know, where where we're kind of thinking about this. And I even like the idea of this knowledge work, this create, distribute, and apply, CDA. I'm going to kind of remember that, or CAD. Try to find a way to kind of remember, because I remember in medical school, we were all the time trying to create mnemonics, you know, to, to remember yeah. like some vast it's knowledge. It. There are lots of methods to locate it in the brain. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I kind of to, to, to make it indexable, so to speak, you know, and make it, ah, oh, that's that's the one. Yes, ah, oh, that's the answer, you know. Um, and when I look at the future, you know, I know like doctors who are terrified of, of AI because they think it will replace them. But in reality, and this I've learned actually also through listening to other people as well. So what I'm about to say now, it's uh, like an infusion of knowledge of different uh, experts in digital health. And uh, we are in a future where we know that health professionals who don't use AI or who don't use any form of technology, let's make it even wider, they will simply be replaced by those who use them. That's all. Uh, and it's, and the equation is really simple. And I'm not saying this to kind of enhance the digital divide or to make it even wider, but at the end of the day, people will gravitate towards health professionals who will make use of all the available tools. It will happen naturally. You know, like for example, having a private practice where one will be connected to a digital health record and another one who doesn't bother. You know, they just use paper, for example. People will naturally gravitate towards the one who offers them the best service. And this happens with any kind of business even more. When you have the old way of doing things, people kind of gravitate towards the new way of doing things just because it's a better service. It happens. It happened all the time. So this like the, these are really the the challenges ahead of us and like looking towards the future. You know, I uh, you know the digital head and medtech future is, like it's it's incredible. Like it's so bright. You know, there are so many opportunities ahead of us, and the pandemic even brought out these even stronger. And my question to you is, how do you see yourself and your organization, especially Pantaflow, kind of fit into this future? You've already mentioned a lot of examples which are really amazing. And I really can't wait for you to share these examples, possibly in MedTech World, in Malta this year, maybe. We'll see. We'd love I would, I, I, I would I, <laughs> Yeah, that would be, I'd love to, to see you there. And like, how do you see it work? Like, what's your, uh, what are your thoughts about this? Yes, I pretty much agree with everything what you said, as the disruption will be big. It's not, we cannot see it there yeah, like, it, like, like it can be. It's not uh, like it could be. It's not at the optimum yet, but it will be. And as you said, and the patients will choose where they have the best treatment. And if you have all processes are done analog, physical, so your data is not on the computer. If the data is on a computer, it can't be analyzed. So you can't, AI can work, do the work, and then the consequence is you have to be that hard, patients will die because you can't give them the optimal treatment because you can't use the information. And I'm like a person, I'm more like, like the thinker. I'm, I just I like to portray the things which are there. So I see that there's a lot of changes coming and this, this is really complex. There are not simple answers for every healthcare company, what they should do or a hospital provider or a healthcare provider because there are different answers for everything. And Hunter Flow takes more or less the role in displaying where does the company is and what is the potential, what they can get with AI, just to show them what, what are the possibilities. We go there, look at, look, what, what have you got? Have you got data? What is your bottleneck? What do you want to achieve? And we more or less work with knowledge graphs, which means we Take your data, then we have interconnected data sets. Then we, uh, the, the, this is data which has meaning. And with this meaning, you can reason the end underlying data and ma make confident complex decisions. It's more or less simply explained, but we, we 
help help companies make decisions for their for their bottleneck. Is it to grow, to to have more patients, be cost efficient, and this is our role of point of law in consulting health companies. Wow, wow. So I'm sure you have quite a bright future ahead of you, um, Ilya. You know, I mean. There are so many, like now, especially with the upcoming European health data space regulation, which I'm sure you've heard about, and with good data and high quality data, what will inevitably follow is AI of high quality, because we really need to f- f- like sort out the basics first, especially in healthcare, and making all these different links with all, with all these data linkages will literally be the foundations of high quality AI that can bring great outcomes. The AI that we're seeing right now, I believe, especially the AI that um, um, that's happening right now, it's really dependent on maybe four or five sources maximum. But with a future where European health data, or even this could be not just European, but it could be a global health data space for all I know, especially in cases of emergencies. But when we, we, we kind of have this vision and like stand, like making an effort to standardize, making an effort to, listen, let's talk to each other. It's not about like who has the biggest field or it's not about like, let's talk to each other so that we learn from each other, so that we move together forward to, to each other. You know, and I think that's going to really change and it's going to really bring incredible outcomes, I think, as well when it comes to to ai i I totally agree yeah you know so so there is really huge potential there and i'm really curious how it's all going to turn out and i'm really reading the regulation closely but it's it's not about the regulation sometimes about the vision and i know that pantaflow has a really big role there but believe it or not Ilya, we've come to the end of the podcast i'd love to speak to you for hours Time flies. Um, it does fly. So, like, really quick, uh, quick fire question: Will we see you at MedTech World this year? How it's going to turn out? Any plans? Like, are you going to ma- try? Are you going to try to make it? As I've been last year already there, and I'll talk to Ryan and Dylan. I've been there on stage also next like, this year. I've come yes, up. yes. <laughs> so, I really can't wait to 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 see you there. Um, really hope, like, fingers crossed that you can make it. So. Ilya, I have one minute now and an important minute for you. And I would like to invite you to raise awareness on any specific topic of your choice. It doesn't have to be healthcare. It can be related to anything else. For uh, I know it could be something on fashion or some ch- favorite charity of your choice. But really, the floor is to you. And we get started now. I want to say that healthcare professionals of all kinds, these are the best data scientists of the future. Don't feel intimidated with all these fancy titles and how much people have done. We need specialists who know what they do. The technical part you can learn, it is, it is already there, technically everything is possible, but we need people who are fostering implementation of AI and these are healthcare professionals, not, not only physicians, but medtech developers, uh, healthcare providers, social insurances, look into the AI and understand how, how AI is working. Because if we don't look into AI, black boxes are created. And if we don't understand AI, this is, the, uh, this is what becomes dangerous. Because then we are like, oh, everything is done without us knowing what is happening there. And then this is, the, this is then when we uh, live in a world with, where we don't want to be. So I really want to say that we have to, every one of us should understand the basics because you need it in the practice and it's not that difficult. Wow, the anti-black box movement. I am I, definitely joining this movement because um, I know that uh, like transparent AI, the, like the way that artificial is done, like in a transparent way, and like not even transparent, but explainable AI even. That means that you understand how did the AI come to that solution. That is because yes. it was based on one million, um, one million uh, cases analyzed with this and this diagnosis had this and this outcome after taking this and that medicine. 
you know, yes. and that's why I suggested this to you. But then, for example, you might want to talk back to the AI and say, listen, but have you considered also ethnic origin, for example, because the data might have not been there? And then it kind of cross Excellent. filters Excellent. also for that. That is Excellent I, example, I, yeah. <laughs> so anti-black box. We don't want black box. We want explainable AI. We want to know how the AI got to that solution because we believe, like, and this is like something which really strikes me. When I want to talk to doctors about AI, and I try to kind of, you know, make them realize of the potential as well. I kind of make them think that when they're using AI, they are literally having 1,000 doctors next to them, you know, or one, if not 1,000, maybe 100 doctor, doctors next to them and giving them like feedback on their particular case. If that is the real potential, you know, and especially when we'll be having more of these data linkages and data and connected data sources from all over the world, like the 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 opportunities are boundless, you know. Uh, like even thinking about, for example, a patient coming from North Africa and then coming to Europe, and then from the data that comes from North Africa, which will I which I hope in the next decade will be continuously improving, then you can kind of follow this patient journey, and the outcomes will be really optimized for that patient who was exposed to this and that environment. I mean, like just thinking about it is like poof. Um, yes. the possibilities are amazing and with that in mind we've come to the end of this episode Ilya I'd like to encourage our audience to follow the show links where you where you can also learn about Pantaflow you can learn about Ilya and his achievements and I recommend that you follow us on all the different podcast channels like you name it Apple Podcasts Google Podcasts you can find us anywhere Anchor Spotify you name it. And even better than that, if you want, there is also the video format. So there is a video interview and there's a podcast. And you can do that by following our channels on MedTechWord on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And with that in mind, goodbye, Ilya. And see you in Mota, maybe. Cheers. Thank you much, Stefan. See you. Bye-bye. See you.